to the platform Swiss Liver Patients Association, Swiss HIPAA. Today, with the presentation of Professor Darius Morapur, head physician of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University Hospital Lausanne, on the topic of Hepatitis C. Welcome, Professor Morapur. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Bobzin. Uh, it's my pleasure and my privilege today uh, to speak about hepatitis C. Um, first of all, I would like to um, show you some uh, additional uh, sources of uh, information uh, in English. Uh, in this context, I can uh, highly recommend um, the website of uh, Swiss Hepatitis, uh, the address uh, is indicated here, uh, which really gives uh, up-to-date and easily understandable information on uh, viral hepatitis, not only hepatitis C, also the other types of viral hepatitis. I can also recommend the website of the Swiss Hepatitis C Association, uh, which is also in addition to the national languages in English. For those of you who would like to go more in depth, uh, there is a very nice uh, article that was published uh, recently in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and that can be found uh, online, uh, including uh, an information page for patients. Now, the hepatitis C virus, uh, illustrated uh, schematically on this slide, is one of the five viruses that primarily infect the liver and cause acute and or chronic hepatitis. The others are the two enterally transmitted viruses, hepatitis A and E virus, and then the three parenterally uh, transmitted viruses, hepatitis B, C and D, or Delta virus. And today we will concentrate on the hepatitis C virus. Hepatitis C virus uh, infection represents a major challenge worldwide. It's estimated that about 70 million people are chronically infected uh, with this virus globally and about 40,000 in Switzerland. It is still one of the most common causes of chronic hepatitis, liver cirrhosis and liver cancer, that is hepatocellular carcinoma. Since hepatitis C runs asymptomatically, that is without symptoms for many years, most of the infected persons are unaware of their infection. Globally, it's estimated that only one in five are diagnosed and only a minority are currently treated. In Switzerland, it's estimated that maybe one third of all infections have yet to be diagnosed. The, treatment, the landscape for hepatitis C has changed dramatically. It has improved, as you will see, enormously over the years but diagnosis and access to care still need to be improved on a global level. Different from hepatitis A and B, where we have very efficient vaccines, vaccine development for hepatitis C remains challenging due to the high genetic variability of this virus. The discovery of the hepatitis C virus was really a milestone of modern medicine for which Harvey Alter, Michael Houghton and Charles Rice were awarded with the Nobel Prize for Medicine last year. To illustrate to you what this discovery means, here is one illustration. Hepatitis C virus was typically transmitted through blood transfusions before the introduction of screening tests for the blood supply. If one had to have a blood transfusion in the 70s or 80s, the risk to be infected with hepatitis C virus was one in 100. 
And as surgery was not as advanced at, as it is today, often multiple transfusions were necessary with big interventions. So if one had 10 blood transfusions in the course of major surgery, the risk to get infected with this virus was 10%. Today, with the introduction first of screening of the blood supply for elevated liver tests and then serological screening for antibodies against the hepatitis C virus, and then finally nucleic acid-based testing of blood products, post-transfusion hepatitis C has virtually disappeared. The hepatitis C virus, uh, schematically again illustrated here, is a member of a virus family that is called the Flaviviridae. Other members of this, flavary, of this uh, family are the yellow fever virus, the dengue virus, Zika, and others. The virus has a single-stranded RNA genome. This genome is surrounded by a capsid, and the capsid is surrounded by an envelope. As I said, this virus is genetically highly variable. We can distinguish seven different genotypes. These genotypes and even individual viruses that circulate in a given patient have differences in their envelope protein structure. And so it is very difficult to develop a conventional vaccine against this viral infection. Transmission occurs parenterally, that uh, means through blood or blood products uh, primarily. Uh, this was especially through blood transfusions prior to the introduction of screening tests at the, uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, the virus was discovered in 1989. Uh, first generation of screening tests came out rapidly thereafter and second generation very reliable screening tests were introduced around 1992. The virus can also be transmitted through injection drug use or in general unsafe injection practices if instruments that are not sterile are used. Contrary to hepatitis B, sexual and mother to infant transmission are rare for hepatitis C. This uh, map illustrates the current epidemiology of hepatitis C virus infection. As you can see, uh, the virus is distributed globally but with some areas that have a high prevalence, including, for example, Egypt, uh, where a particular genotype, genotype 4, predominates. Now, when caring for persons that are infected with the hepatitis C virus, the first and one of the most important aspects is to discover the infection at a stage uh, that is early before late complications occur. And for this, different screening strategies have been proposed. One is healthcare provider initiated testing for chronic HCV infection based on certain risk factors. And some of these risk factors are illustrated here. They can be medical risk factors, as we said, uh, for example, in recipients of blood transfusions or blood products before 1992. There are demographic factors, someone who was born and grew up in a region of the world where hepatitis C virus infection is highly prevalent. Behavioral risk factors, uh, drug use uh, and others, as you can see here occupational risk factors and others. This is the clinical and laboratory course of an acute hepatitis C virus infection. Time zero is the moment of infection 
in this graphic. And as you can see here, there is an incubation period before the increase of liver function tests. And here it is the ALT, the alanine aminotransferase, which indicates that the liver is inflamed. This incubation period is usually anywhere between three weeks and three months. During this time of liver test elevation and of hepatitis, patients can, but only sometimes actually, develop symptoms. These symptoms can be quite unspecific, fatigue, malaise, maybe uh, some right upper quadrant uh, abdominal pain, and only rarely jaundice. During this time, the viral genome can be detected in blood by PCR, by a polymerase chain reaction, which allows to amplify the viral RNA genome. And then antibodies uh, are developed and uh, remain detectable. In the case of an acute hepatitis C, the virus uh, is then eliminated, uh, transaminase, normalize, and anti-HCV persists uh, as a sign of uh, contact with this virus. More commonly, however, this virus persists and causes chronic hepatitis C. In this case, the virus is not eliminated, that is, it remains detectable, the antibodies remain detectable, and liver tests can uh, remain uh, elevated, usually not very high and fluctuating. So in order to make a diagnosis of chronic hepatitis C, we have anti-HCV antibodies, which cannot distinguish between an active infection and a resolved infection that you saw previously. To make this distinction, you need a PCR test for HCV RNA, which indicates that the viral is still replicating. This is the natural history, the natural course of hepatitis C virus infection. Most persons that are infected with this virus develop chronic infection. It's estimated that 50 to 80% of acutely infected individuals will develop chronic hepatitis C. This, as we said, runs a course that is often asymptomatic for many years or even decades. However, during this time, a proportion of patients develop liver cirrhosis, that is progressive scarring of the liver tissue with uh, scar tissue uh, deposition and ultimately the development of cirrhosis. It's estimated that after 30 years of chronic hepatitis, between 15 and 30% of the patients will develop cirrhosis. Once cirrhosis has developed, there is a high risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma, that is primary liver cancer. The risk is estimated to be one to 6% per year. So patients with chronic hepatitis C and cirrhosis need to be regularly surveilled for the appearance of hepatocellular carcinoma. We now have very efficacious, uh, efficacious uh, treatment for hepatitis C, which can actually revert fibrosis or even cirrhosis if it is as an, at an early stage. However, the risk of liver cancer development is not completely eliminated in patients who had cirrhosis, even if their chronic hepatitis C has been treated successfully. So in this case, continued surveillance will be proposed. How can we assess the different fibrosis stages? There is liver biopsy with the microscopical examination of a liver tissue sample on the one hand, 
and there are non-invasive methods on the other. One of these non-invasive methods that are used regularly is fibroscan. And here you can see the different stages. This is the Metavir staging system that goes from zero, no fibrosis, to four, cirrhosis. And the corresponding fibroscan liver stiffness measurements. These are always estimations, but they can be very useful in assessing the stage of liver fibrosis in chronic hepatitis C. How does it work? Uh, here you see uh, an illustration of such a fibroscan apparatus, uh, which uses a probe that combines uh, a me mechanical principle, uh, which launches uh, a pulse wave through the liver and an ultrasound uh, in the same probe that measures the velocity of propagation of this pulse wave. And uh, as liver stiffness increases the velocity of the propagation of this pulsation or of this pulse wave increases, and this can then be transformed in liver stiffness values which are expressed in kilopascal. This is a non-invasive very simple and very rapid means to estimate liver fibrosis stage. Now, enormous progress has been made in terms of achieving sustained virological response in hepatitis C. Sustained virological response is really the goal of treatment in this type of viral hepatitis. It means sustained elimination of the virus as measured by a negative PCR test in blood three months after the end of antiviral therapy. In the early days after the discovery of this virus, this could be achieved only in around 15% of patients with interferon alpha based therapy and interferon alpha is a difficult to tolerate treatment with numerous adverse effects and also contraindications. Response rates could be improved by combination therapy with ribavirin, further improved by the development of pegylated interferon alpha, which was a long acting form of interferon alpha that had to be administered only once per week, again in combination with, therapy, with, with ribavirin, but really results improved dramatically only with the introduction of direct acting antivirals, which specifically block viral enzymes. And it is since 2014 that we now have interferon-free oral combination therapies with close to 100% chance of cure. This is really a success story of modern medicine to go from the discovery of an infectious agent to cure within 25 years. This is again the abstract of the seminal paper by Michael Houghton and his colleagues describing the molecular cloning and the identification of the hepatitis C virus, which at the time was called non-A, non-B hepatitis. This success is reminiscent of a Swiss success story, which is the building of the Gotthard Base Tunnel, which also took 25 years, and it is 25 years, it was 57 kilometers that were surmounted. Key to success in this uh, case were the intermediary attack points and successive milestones. And the same is actually true for hepatitis C. 
these intermediary attack points in the case of hepatitis C were milestones in the understanding of the replication of the life cycle of this virus and in the development of model systems that allow to study this virus in tissue culture in vitro and then to develop and to improve antiviral therapies. These efforts have led to a very detailed understanding of the viral life cycle that is schematically illustrated here that starts with the entry of the virus into the liver cell, the building up of what we call a replication complex, the amplification of the viral genome and the building of new viral particles that are then released from the liver cell. And this detailed understanding has allowed to develop specific inhibitors of key steps of this viral life cycle. These inhibitors, which are now used in clinical practice, are protease inhibitors, polymerase inhibitors, and the inhibitors of a non-structural protein 5A. And these act at different steps of the viral life cycle. They can block viral protein processing and the building up of this replication complex. They can block viral amplification, viral RNA replication, or they can block viral replication and particle formation at the same time in the case of NS5A inhibitors. Concretely, the drugs that we use today are listed in this table. We have three different protease inhibitors, grasoprevir, glecaprevir, and voxilaprevir, three different NS5A inhibitors, elbasvir, velpatasvir, and pibrentasvir, and one nucleotidic polymerase inhibitor, sofosbuvir. And these can now be combined, as you can see on the right, in different drugs, the, the two that are most used today uh, as first-line treatments are Eplusa, which is composed of the NS5A inhibitor Velpatasvir and the polymerase inhibitor Sofosbuvir, or Maviret, which is composed of the protease inhibitor Glecapevir and the NS5A inhibitor Pibrentasvir. These drugs uh, are uh, being administered typically in the form of one or three tablets per day for eight to 12 weeks with more than 95% success in the treatment of hepatitis C. For those of you who are more interested and would like to uh, know in more detail what the detailed treatment recommendations are, I indicated some sources of further information uh, below. Now with this really, uh, hepatitis has been brought onto its uh, knee, but there is still work to do. And some uh, open challenges and perspectives for research in hepatitis C are illustrated in this slide. There are still important challenges in terms of our basic understanding of the molecular virology and the pathogenesis of hepatitis C, but also in translational medicine, especially in terms of vaccine development, and also on the clinical side, especially as we said, in terms of diagnosing persons that are infected and access to care. With this, I would like to close and thank you for your interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the instructive and exciting presentation, Professor Morapur, and your great personal commitment. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.